thank you, Sister Elaine, for the introduction. And thank you, Sister Donna, for that wonderful song, Until You Know uh, What It Means to Be Loved of God. Thank you for such a wonderful message. And that is my prayer this morning that we might be able to know what that looks like. As for review, the last time I spoke with us, this group, we went. I went over the sermon entitled Nike, He Will Do It. Um, and this was a sermon on the nature of Christ. And specifically that he had two natures. And because of those two natures, he was able to deal with a major problem that helped us to know the love of God. As a summary slide, I reviewed the last time the eight different types of sin that were mentioned in the Bible. The first five are sin as an action. The next two, six and seven, are sin as a nature. And the last one is the unpardonable sin of rejecting the gift that God has given to us through his son, Jesus. Okay, uh, picking up from the eight different types. One of the key uh, verses that I reviewed was Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his son, his own son, in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. And this is a key verse because while we know that in our nature, we cannot beat or battle sin, Jesus was able to. And while Jesus died for our sins as action, Jesus lived a life that is worthy to condemn sin in the flesh. And so praise God that God had a plan and Jesus was able to live that. And this is how we might know the love of God. Hebrews 4.15 goes on to say that Jesus was, uh, is our high priest, and he was touched uh, in all points just like we are, but yet without sin. So if you wanted to study this in more detail, it is on the Exposing Truth Ministry, so I thank you for that, uh, that ability to, to record these videos and post it on the website. We are almost done. We are on the seventh pillar of this system, Necros, today. Um, and this is what we have gone over so far. And so um, as a preview, I wanted to highlight this wonderful study that uh, Brother Rob did. So if you have time, I'm going to choose a better color. If you have time, this, oh, that's bad. I'll just use a pen. This is a great video. To go over and i thank brother rob for actually going over this content which is essentially the introduction to what i'm going to go over so much of this stuff you guys have already gone over a key text this morning is first thessalonians 4 13 but i would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning those which are asleep that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope a sermon this morning is entitled necros everlasting burning shall we pray Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you have given us your son, Jesus, that we might know the love of God that lies, that you love us so much that you sent him to die for us. We thank you, Lord, for his death, that we might be atoned and we might be made right with, him, with you, that we as dust are nothing, but you see us worthy to be called brethren and to be made sons and daughters of the Most High. Help us to live true to that calling, and uh, may Jesus be lifted and uh, all be drawn to him. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Continuing on. As we have discussed in prior sermons, Genesis 2-7 serves as a ma major foundation for how we understand the nature of man, in that there is a formula, dust plus breath equals a soul. So we know from algebra, dust or D plus B equals S. And so if you wanted to define, let me just put it into things that we might be easily able to discuss. So body plus spirit equals soul. And so just using a little bit of algebra, when we solve for body, body is a soul minus the spirit. And likewise, if we soul, solve for spirit, is a soul minus a body okay that's basically algebra when you look at that and we, i wanted to kind of show that this is consistent in the bible and it's an easy way for us to be able to understand 
what this means so we might understand the topic this morning, which is on death. Notice here what it says in Psalms 146.2. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. What's interesting is the term here, while I have any being, is actually a phrase. And it basically in the Hebrew means to have, means to, to be allowed to continue. Uh, and that's interesting there. Two verses later in the same chapter, Psalms 146.4, his breath goes forth. He returned to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. I want to say here that the word here for breath in the Hebrew is the word ruach. And going back to this, this verse, Brother Rob kind of touched on this in his prior sermon. The breath here is the word nesama. And the soul here is the word nefesh. And so I need to make sure that we understand the distinction between breath and soul, because this is where the, a lot of the confusion has come. Nobody makes any distinction or makes any qualms about dust. But when it comes to the understanding of the, the non-immortality of the soul, it's a failure to understand that these two are, are distinct and they have their anchoring or their origins in understanding here in Genesis 2-7. So going back to Psalms 146-4, this word breath here is the Hebrew word ruah. And I'm going to provide us an easy chart for us to be able to understand these because understanding this is kind of key for putting this all together. Ecclesiastes 12.7, then shall the dust, which is our body, return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. The spirit here is the ruah. Remember, Man became a living soul, sold as nefesh, not ruah. So ruah and nefesh are something completely different. Job 14, 12. So man lieth down and riseth not, till the heavens be no more, and they shall not awake, nor shall be, nor be raised out of their sleep. Lieth down here is a metaphor. In the Hebrew, this word is sakab, and this is a metaphor for death. And so you can see here, even in the Old Testament, they, uh, the Old Testament Jews understood death as a sleep. And we'll talk more about this later when Jesus has more to say on the topic. Notice what it says here, once, Psalms 115 and 17. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. So notice that death is equated with silence. So there's nothing that goes on when you die. And of course, one of the common Bible verses to defend the state of the dead, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So again, we know that the dead know nothing, and the dead do not continue beyond you know, the, the living life that they live. Notice what it says here in Isaiah 38, 18 and 19. For the grave cannot praise thee. Death cannot celebrate thee. They cannot go down into the pit. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. The living, he sh the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. The father of the children shall make known thy truth. This goes back to what we were discussing in Sabbath school, that we want to share the gospel and how we should always live to praise God while he gives us breath. And sometimes we forget to be grateful. And we think we want to complain all the time, but we forget that God is so gracious that he extends his, our lives one day at a time. And we should be grateful for that and give him the praise and give him the glory. I wanted to introduce another concept or another term that has its origins in the Old Testament. And this is Job 14.10. But man dieth and wasteth away, yea, man giveth up the ghost. And where is he? Giveth up the ghost here is the Hebrew word gava, which is a basically a euphemism to say to die, to perish, to be ready to die. And the reason why I say this is because most of the verses that I've touched on are all out of the Old Testament. So how do we transition to have a continuous understanding of this formula found in Genesis 2 as we go into the New Testament? A good linking verse is Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, okay, 
but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in heaven. The word body here is the word soma. Okay. The word here for soul is the word psyche. Okay. And this is kind of important because when we look at the word soul here, we'll see some interesting words to make a distinction between soul and spirit. Another word, uh, another verse to kind of carry the same concept out of the Old Testament into the New, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The word here again for soul is psyche. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Okay, psyche. Let's go look at what this looks like in the Greek. So psyche, here we know, is used 105 times in the Bible, translated mostly as soul. But there are other alternative ways this is rendered in or translated in the New Testament. And notice here what it says here in the definition. And I wanted us to see this in particular. So notice here that it is the breath, by implication, a spirit, abstractly or concretely. So basically what they're trying to say is that this psyche is the breath. But I want us to look more carefully at this grouping of numbers that they give here. So notice what it says here, respectively to the Hebrew, these terms match up. And I wanted just to show the linkage. So this 5590 links with that. 50, excuse me, 4151 links up with this. And then 2222 links up with 2416. So just and so what is now 5315? This is the word nephesh. So notice that nephesh, or from Genesis 2 7, man became a living soul. Soul of the word there is nephesh. Nephesh links with psyche. So when we see soul there, we have to think that that's the linkage here between Old Testament and New Testament. And so this 4151 is the word pneuma and the word 50, excuse me, G, excuse me, H7307 is the Hebrew word ruah. So this is the word here for spirit. Okay, that's the word for spirit. And H2416 and G2222 are more for lower life forms. So the key here that I wanted to bring out is that 5315, which we know in the Old Testament links to uh, nephesh, is soul, and that we know 57, excuse me, 5307 is the word ruah, which uh, links to spirit or pneuma. So as an easy chart, here is the linkage, here's that same passage or that paragraph linked linking the two old and the new testaments these words in general so we know from genesis 2 7 this is the word soul so whenever we see psyche we can substitute the old old testament uh, hebrew word for soul ruah as i use in other texts in from the old testament specifically from the psalms is the word spirit and then we can see in the new testament this is pneuma from which we get spirit. And that's kind of a major point I wanted to make. Let me show this in one continuous verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So notice, Adam became a living soul, okay, psyche. And the last Adam was made a quickening spirit, pneuma. Okay, we'll go into this a little bit more later on in the sermon. But I wanted to show one of the major one of the major understandings or verses that people might use to say that people go on to go to heaven and have a blissful existence. And one of these is found in Revelation 6, 9. Notice what it says here. And when he opened, he had opened this fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. 
and for the testimony which they held. And so notice here that the men, the seals are being opened in heaven. That's the context. And we see here that John the Revelator is seeing souls under the altar. And I just want to, we know that why are the souls under the altar? We know that in the sanctuary system, the blood was poured out at the base of the altar of sacrifice. So the blood is now poured into the earth as a symbol of the sins being transferred onto the earth for eventual cleansing. And how do we know, how do we make that distinction is when we look at the metals used in the sanctuary. We know that in the outer court, the metals used are bronze, but once we get into the sanctuary, whether it be the holy or the most holy place, all the metals are made of gold. So that distinguishes the earth from the earth from the heavenly ministries, which are summarized in the sanctuary system. And when you see souls under the altar, that does not sound like a heavenly paradise. So with a little bit of thinking, you can under, you can see in this verse that these souls are not really enjoying heavenly bliss. Looks, let's look what it says in the next verse. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not avenge, dost not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. So notice these, the souls under the altar. And so these people are crying. And so this does not sound like heavenly bliss if you're crying for vengeance and for judgment. And so when you look at this is a proof text that I've seen, some people will use to say, hey, you know what, we don't, there's an existence in heaven, you know, beyond the grave. So how do you square this round peg? The best way to understand it is to see where else in the Bible do you see, see people crying out. The best example that I came with is Genesis 4.10. And notice what it says here. And he said, this is God speaking with Cain. What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. So notice here that God can hear the, the injustice and the bad things that are happening to his people and the spilled blood that, and remember, it's the, the blood cries to God. It doesn't cry to anyone else. So God hears these pleas. God knows the injustice. And he is a right, he is a righteous judge, and he will know when to to judge and when the time will be. And what I find most interesting is in all of scripture, Abel is never recorded to say a word. There's no conversation, no nothing. But the only speaking that Abel does is his blood crying out to God for vengeance. How interesting that the righteous might be remembered like that. So going back to Revelation chapter 6, notice here, continuing on in verse 11, to those that were under the, the altar, then white robes were given unto every one of them, and it said, and was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. What's interesting is the fellow servants is an interesting term that basically says, one who serves the same master. So think of those who have died uh, as martyrs uh, serving God. So basically what John is seeing here is that fellow servants, people who serve the same Lord, the same God, will also be vindicated in a similar manner. Also notice the usage of the word brethren. What's interesting is here, the word brethren in the Greek is the word adelpho, and it means a brother of the same father. Oh, man, God wants to include us in his family. He wants to adopt us to become heirs to the kingdom of God. How, how better way to know the love of God other than that, that God wants us to make that known, okay? So what might await those who are still alive, us who are fellow servants, us who are brethren to these who've already been slain? And I want to bring this to a modern day issue that we will face, especially today in 2024. And that is the lie that the original lie that was told to Eve. 
that ye shall not surely die. And this is that immortal, uh, immortality of the soul that has been perpetuated by all the pagan religions. So we have to know that this exists outside of Christianity, and this is what the rest of the world believes. So look at what it says here in Scripture, Leviticus 20, verse 6. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them. So when we think of wizards, we think of, oh, you know, somebody with that nice cap and cast spells. When you look at the Hebrew, a wizard is a knower, one who has a familiar spirit. Okay, so it sounds like somebody who's been possessed. And a familiar spirit is basically a necromancer, somebody who evokes the dead. So he's trying to speak with the dead. So again, while these words in the Old English render like this, the key is to go back to the original language to understand that these are not uh, righteous people uh, nonetheless. Continue on in Revelation 26, 20 verse 6, God will set his face against that soul and he will cut him off from among his people. So I wanted to review a story in the Old Testament of Saul. So the context here is Samuel has now died and Saul had put away all the those who had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. There came a crisis where Saul was now forced to, to deal with the Philistines and he did not have Samuel to rely on for guidance. And God, it was when he asked God of, for an answer, and because Saul's heart was hardened against God, God did not answer him. And neither did he use the Urim, which is the, one of the stones on the, uh, the high priest's breastplate. And neither did the prophet speak to Saul. So basically, God went silent. And Saul was trying to figure out how, who, how he should lead this, the people. He became desperate. So look what he, said, look what he asked in verse 7. Then, Saul, then said Saul unto his servant, Seek me a woman who, that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And behold, his servant said unto him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit in Endor. So again, they found somebody who is a necromancer, and Saul goes out to meet him. So when she asks, who do you want me to try to contact? Who do you want me to try to conjure? And notice Saul says, bring me up Samuel. <laughs> notice here, remember, Samuel needs Saul needs guidance. He can't get it from God. So guess what? He tries to ask the necromancer to bring up dead Samuel. That's how desperate Saul was. And notice here what this witch of Endor says. The woman, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul saying, why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. So she knows that even though he tried to hit it, hide his physical state, because of her connections, with evil spirits, evil or familiar spirits, she was able to discern who he really was. The next verse is kind of interesting. And so notice what it says here. And king, the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. I'm highlighting the word gods because when you look at the Hebrew here, I want you to be very shocked to see what it says here. I saw gods ascending out of the earth. The word gods here is H0430, which we know is Elohim. That's the word that is used in that position. So they're saying Elohim was going ascending out of the earth. So now you're going to scratch your head and you say, what in the world? This has to be wrong. Okay. This has to be wrong. So I want to show you how to understand this. So in the Hebrew, there are two categories of usage. It can either, either be plural or plural intensive singular meaning. So in this verse in 1 Samuel, the mention here is for just simply plural. It could be rulers, judges, divine ones, angels, or gods. But once it's used as a plural intensive with a singular meaning, it is meant in reference to the one true God. And how do you know this? When you look at the verb tense in the sentence that it's being used, you usually, if it's used in the plural, 
you'll see a plural verb form. But if it's used as singular meaning, you'll see the verb form in a singular tense. And so that's how you can tell which gods, which Elohim is being referenced to in the Old Testament. Okay. And another way of, ex this is called the plural magisterium. And so if you wanted to look that up, because a lot of people might use Elohim or the definition of Elohim to say this is plural. So therefore, God is a plurality. So this is how you understand the Hebrew language. So that way you can understand that. First Timothy 4.1 talks about, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Seducing spirits are misleading or leading into error. And I wanted to kind of take a trip down modern society to kind of show what these seducing spirits look like. And we can definitely, as we discussed in Sabbath school, we are definitely in the latter times. So we know that this, we are there and this is where we can be deceived. And so how did this all start? In 1964, a TV show hit the American airwaves called Bewitched. And if you remember, this was a comedic look at, at uh, witchcraft. The, the main character was literally a witch and she would use her witchcraft in humorous ways to get out of life situations. And this aired from 1964 to 1972. And in so doing, what you do is you lay down a foundation of non, not so scary uh, usages of magic so that way it can be normalized. So you fast forward a couple years and there was a major movie that hit the, that hit the uh, theaters in 1986 called Top Gun. And there is a meme that is made from this movie that is floating around the internet. And the theme is this pilot here is wanting to communicate with his dead co-pilot. So he says the phrase, talk to me, Goose, Goose being his co-pilot. And that's basically how Satan normalizes spiritualism. This is how this gets into the modern culture such that we believe this thing hook, line, and sinker. These seeds were planted way back, way before, so such that now you can introduce much more greater modern errors. In 1990, there's a movie entitled Ghost, where, and when I was preparing for the sermon, I just happened to be passing a, a patient's room at the hospital, and I noticed that this movie was playing, and I stopped to watch it because I, I don't remember this movie at all. And basically what happens is this guy had died and she was still alive. So she is still living and he was dead. And what had happened is she went to a medium and that medium is played by an actress, Whoopi Goldberg. And through Whoopi Goldberg, she interacts with this dead character. And I was like, whoa, I totally forgot about this. And this is how this is introduced and normalized into modern society. Because in people who read scripture, you're like, no, nah, we're not supposed to be doing this stuff. But when you watch this stuff, and this is what is popular, popular to the tune of $500 million. That's how much this movie made in the box office in 1990. That's a lot of money. Okay. Fast forward another decade. A TV show came out that I ran for several years called Charmed. And these four ladies are basically witches. And it follows how they use witchcraft. So you can see over time, the devil uses these people to be a lot more sophisticated, such that they can bring these concepts and topics into modern society. And it becomes something that people grow up with. And now people aspire to. Okay. Then you have... Twilight. I've never seen this, but apparently the book sold over 100 million copies worldwide and the movies released over a series of six years grossed $3.3 billion in a worldwide box office. So that's how much the modern society is drinking this up. And of course, the poster child of all this spiritualism is Harry Potter. Harry Potter, the book series, Ran was published over a 10-year period spanning from 1997 to 2007. The movies 
followed suit from 2001 to 2010, and the movies alone grossed $7.7 billion. That's how the appetite of modern society has for this stuff. This is what seducing spirits looks like in the world around us. So it looks innocuous to the average person, but to those that know what the Bible speaks on these topics, we have to understand and we have to be able to show light on these topics. And I want us to show where this is so important. Isaiah 8, 19. And when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? So basically, notice what Isaiah is saying here. Should Who should we be going to be asking for? Who should we be seeking guidance from? Like Saul, should we be going to the witch of Endor? Or should we be seeking God? And I want to put this into context because the next verse everyone uses, but here's the context to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So just as, uh, as a context, notice that this verse eight to speak against where should we be seeking counsel? Where should we be looking for guidance? And I find it, I find when I came across this, I was like, praise be to God that he gives us the word that, that we might be, we have a word that we can trust on. It's a lamp unto our uh, feet and a light unto our path that we might know the way to walk. So now I wanted to transition to how Jesus looks at death. And the context of Mark chapter five is Jesus was going to go visit Jairus's daughter and Jairus's daughter had already died and when Jesus comes he meets people who are weeping and notice this what he says why make ye do this this ado and weep the damsel is not dead but sleepeth and notice Jesus uses the term sleep many times and this is the Greek word kathiudo which is a euphemism to be dead but, you, uh, but it's translated to sleep, and it, it's kind of interesting. And then notice here, John 11, 11, we know that John 11 is the Lazarus chapter. And notice what Jesus says here to his disciples, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. And the word here sleepeth in the Greek is koimayo, which basically is a euphemism or a metaphor to die. And notice here that when translating from the Greek into English, it's translated as sleep. It's not saying our la friend Lazarus is dead, but it's saying he, Lazarus sleeps. And then notice here, Jesus then speaks plainly three verses later. And then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Notice the word here, dead in the Greek is the word apothnesko. Okay. And we know later on in the chapter, Jesus goes and he gives a specific command. And notice what it says here. Lazarus, come forth. And Jesus had to be very specific. And he had to say, Lazarus. Because if he just said, come forth, <laughs> everyone would have come out of their graves. Okay? But he had to be very specific. And notice a dead Lazarus who had been dead for three days had come uh, was to come forth and the prevailing thought within jewish mysticism of the day was that the dead can usually linger spiritually for approximately three days and this is this is what jewish the modern thinking at jesus's time of uh, what death was usually by day three that's when the juices start to leak out and a dead body starts to decompose and stuff starts flowing out of the orifices and it starts to really stink and smell. And that's why Martha was concerned about Jesus going to the tomb because everyone knows that by day three, day four, this process is starting and the body starts to, to go into corruption. But I wanted this to to, meant to see examine a very interesting verse in this chapter, and we'll touch this we'll touch on this later as well. When Jesus heard that, he said, "This sickness is not unto death, 
but for the glory of God, that the, the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And why does Jesus make this statement, not unto death, when a couple of verses later, Jesus says, Lazarus is dead. And he knew that this sickness, was Jesus talking about something else? Was he talking about more than what we understand as death? And that's where our scripture reading for today comes in. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. And what does that hope look like? Acts 24, 15, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Okay? And notice here, Revelation 22, 11 talks about he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. So notice there are lines of distinction. You have just versus unjust. You have filthy versus clean. You have righteous versus unrighteous. You have holy versus unholy. There is a line of demarcation. It's binary, meaning it's yes or no. There's no in-between. There's no third option. It's one or the other. And that's where the saying of Elijah how long halt ye between three opinions? Nope. How long halt ye between two opinions? So we have to realize that God is trying to distinguish between two specific groups. John 5, 28 says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Okay, notice here. It's all. Everyone shall hear his voice and shall come forth. That they have done good unto the resurrection of life, that they have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So notice that there are two resurrections and that these are words are actually in red. These are Jesus's words. Going to Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 20, we see here a mention of the first resurrection and a mention of the second death. So we can easily we can easily surmise here that if there's a first resurrection, and coupled with the previous verse, there must be a second resurrection. And if there, there's a second death, there must also be a first death. And so what is this second death? This is a couple of verses later. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So notice here. The second death equates to not being found written of life. And we should all strive to make sure that our lives are written in the book of life, that we might be able to participate in the first resurrection. And notice that only after Revelation 20, death and hell are thrown into the lake of fire, then Revelation 21, 4 comes into, comes into effect. And God shall wipe away all their tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away, and this is where God shall make all things new. So what is this second death? Notice what it says. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. So Jesus is now giving a message to the seven churches specifically here that to, about the second death and makes this bold claim in that same John chapter 11 chapter with Lazarus that he is the resurrection and he is the life just simply believing in him though you were dead yet he yet we, we shall live through Jesus and why is this so important this is Revelation 1 verse 18 and notice here it says here I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the key of hell and of death. And notice why the verbiage here is so important. Jesus is alive and was dead. So basically, this is saying that Jesus is resurrected and that he did get to taste death. And because he tasted death, he gets to have the keys of hell and of death. And so we have to ask ourselves, was this the first death that Jesus tasted or the second death that Jesus tasted? And, and where did Jesus get those keys? Okay. 
And notice that a key, if you have the key, you're able to unlock something, you're able to open it, you're able to close it. And so, and while Jesus claimed to be the resurrection and he was able to raise people to life, he didn't have the keys. So how did Jesus get these keys? I wanted to try to explain it by using 1 John 5, 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. Okay. I'm not going to touch the verse prior to this in scripture because that's the Johannian comma. But this verse is a very interesting one. And it means something. 1 John 5, 8. Notice three elements, spirit, water and blood agree to bear witness, bear witness of something. So how does the spirit, how does the water and how does blood agree and how does it bear witness? I want to show you a couple of verses to help you to understand why Jesus is the Lamb of God. John 19, 34, this is at the crucifixion after Jesus had died. The soldier or the centurion now takes a spear and thrusts it into Jesus' side. And when it came for, after he pulled it out, blood and water comes out of Jesus' chest. That goes into the ground. That goes into the earth as a witness of the sins that Jesus died for. Amen. Hallelujah. Hebrews 9.22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. So without Jesus shedding his blood on Calvary, without that spear thrust into his side, without that water and blood uh, gushing forth out of his chest into the earth, there is no stain or there is no blood that's able to cry out for the sins of all of mankind. That's why Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth. And so was Jesus' death just the first death or was it the second death? And so I want to show you that it was more than just simply the first death. This is now the context is Gethsemane. Jesus is praying to his father, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And so we know that this cup is what Jesus had to experience at the crucifixion. And so what is this cup? How do we know what this cup looks like? And do you really want to drink that cup? And, and I, 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 for one, I'm grateful that Jesus drank that cup for me, that I might be able to take his life in my, in, in my stead. So what does that, what that cup look like? Revelation 14.10. This is the second angel's message. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. So consider that the cup that Jesus had to drink was the full unbridled wrath of God. All God's hatred against sin was taken out on Jesus who bore our sins on that cross. Until you know how much God loves you. What a fitting song, Sister Donna. Until you know that Jesus drank that cup for us. And because he drank that cup for us, we do not have to take the wrath of God uh, on our own. He has provided a way out. Notice what it says here in Romans chapter 5. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath. That's that cup there through him. So it's through Christ that we are saved from the wrath. It's because Jesus took that wrath, took that cup and drank it for us. He was able to take that entire wrath, that beating from God and in, in our stead. And because of that, we have we he was made sin for us. And that's what it says here in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. Praise God. And we now know that in Romans 8.1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Spirit there is the word pneuma, okay, is the word pneuma. And the word condemnation there is a damnatory sentence. And so we are not damned anymore as long as we are in Christ. 1 John 5, 11 says, For this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. We can only have eternal life in Jesus. And so 1 Corinthians furthers that, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Jesus bridged that gap. Jesus paid that debt. Jesus died the second death that we might be able to live and have eternal life for him. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Notice what it says here in Psalms 37, 20. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke. They shall consume away. Notice that smoke denotes a full combustion, meaning everything has fully burned away. So it's not this everlasting burning and this, uh, forever torment that, that many would like to believe. And so that is not what the God would want us to do. But rather, we have to understand that God is a merciful God. And so what is this hope? 1 Thessalonians 4.16, that the dead in Christ shall rise first. When the shout of the archangel and the trump of God is sounded at the second coming. And then notice that first group is going to be massive. And this second group, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Imagine what must it be like to be with the Lord. We don't have to imagine. We, we can read scripture to see what it means exactly to be with the Lord. Isaiah 33 starting in verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He that walketh righteously, he that speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hand from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. And he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him, and his water shall be sure. These are great and precious promises for those. As we head into the end times, as we discussed in Sabbath school, there are going to be harder times, and the worst is yet to come. Like I posted in the chat, Daniel 12, 1, there will be time as such was never since the since the uh, all time of human existence so as bad as hitler's holocaust is it's going to be worse than that it's going to be worse than the flood it's going to be worse than sodom and gomorrah we ain't seen nothing yet the limit has not yet been reached the, the there is still one last act in the final drama and god is looking for people who can weather that storm and be faithful to him and that's why paul ends that passage Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Titus 2.13 continues the thought, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I wanted to close with a wonderful passage right after the three angels' message. This is Revelations 14.13. So the three angels' message spans from Revelation 14.6 to Revelation 12. So 6 to 12. Verse 13 is the one immediately after that. Notice what it says here. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit. That they may rest from their labors and their works do follow after them. And as a anthem of reflection, I found an interesting, I found an interesting chorus that was sung during a memorial service uh, for a for a dead pastor. And I wanted to I wanted you guys to reflect on these words as in silence as we listen to our anthem of reflection this morning.
Shall we pray? Dear Father, Lord, we thank you that we don't have to be ignorant concerning those that are asleep, but that they sleep in you and they wait for that final day. Well, you will give the command to arise and awake and corruption shall put on incorruption and mortal shall put on immortality. We thank you, Father, for these exceeding great and precious promises that we might be able to stand, especially amidst the deception and seducing spirits which surround us and actually outnumber us. Father, we thank you that he who is with us is greater than he who is in the world and that you promise to be with us. Continue to be with us as we can we grow and stand in these last days that we might be more fully attached and grounded in Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you.